your morning paper, read all about it. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to Redemption Church. The church where pants are optional, apparently, at this point, because you're all at home. Luckily here, we got the memo to uh, at least go with regular attire. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I, I miss you guys. I really miss you. You know, it's like every Sunday I get this privilege to stand at the door and shake hands, and we have now gone for four Sundays without that, and I'm just like, can't wait for this to come to an end at some point, but we know we're going to be in it for a while. And I just want to encourage all of you, you are doing a great thing. I know sometimes it feels like it's overwhelming, a little daunting, somewhat challenging, but this is the way that we are loving our neighbors. This is how we are doing things, not just for the good of the city, but our region and our world in a lot of ways, right? And so what I want to start off with this morning before we pray is I want to give a big shout out right now. If you're at home, I want you to simply just clap right now. A big shout out to everybody in our medical community. We know that they are sacrificing a great deal. We know they're giving their all and then some more to this particular time. And so it's really huge. I mean, I think about some of the people in our own church, like Annie and Joe and Mary, and I think about uh, like uh, Michelle. My wife, Ellie, is actually in her final year of uh, nursing school, and they're looking to probably have to put her uh, in the hospitals here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, And so there's just a lot of people in our church that's directly connected to that. And so I wanted to say thank you for what you're doing. We want to pray for you today as well as our officials and everything else, because this is just a unique time. And more than us somehow being critical or whatever else, we we need to be prayerful of the people that are having to make hard decisions. And so before we get into Luke this morning, I want to go ahead and pray for all the parties that are having to really be engaged at a very unique level, Uh, praying for them to have wisdom and health and strength and for God's grace to break in in this time. Uh, And then we're going to jump into Luke. So let's go ahead and pray together. Jesus I thank you for the fact that you are good and gracious, and I thank you for the fact that you have uh, instilled in people a knowledge and a know-how to bring uh, flourishing and health and help to those who are hurting. And so right now, I do. I pray for our medical community as they are uh, operating uh, at a very high capacity with great many challenges before them and limited supply. And I pray that you would really uh, fill in those holes, that the supplies would come in, that we would begin to see this thing turn the tide and to flatten the curve as we've been talking about. And so we just pray for special measures of your grace uh, and your healing in this time. And so for wisdom, for insight, for courage, and for tenacity during this particular time. I also pray for all of us as we are looking at your word today and we're looking at your message, Jesus, that Uh, The message today in particular that we would embrace, take into our own lives and hearts in such a way that we can mobilize and display what it is you have for us. And so we thank you for your love toward us. We thank you for your message that brings flourishing to our world, and we pray that we would honor you now. We thank you in your good and perfect name. Amen. Now, before we get started, one other little piece of kind of housekeeping I wanted to do. Uh, If you're new with us, I I know that there's been people that have been sort of checking into Redemption in the last couple of weeks as this has been online. And so if you're new to Redemption and and, and we've not had a chance to interact with you before, just down in the comments right down below me right now, I think is where they're at, uh, you can just say, hey, I'm new here and we'd love to kind of find out a little bit more about you and that kind of thing. That'd be a lot of fun. Also, don't forget the hashtag RC Jammies. That's just a fun little way that we get to see one another. And then also the reminder that we do have an app, and on the app there are notes. And so today, as we're going into the Gospel of Luke, if you would like to follow along with those notes, that would be great. Now, we have now been since Christmas time, actually, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, and it is called the Scandalous God, right? And this whole idea is looking at the message of Jesus, and we're seeing how what he brings to the world is truly a scandalous idea. Like, he wants us to exhibit certain traits and kind of a heart and tendencies that bring flourishing and beauty and encouragement to the world in which we live. And 
as I have continued to study now the message of Jesus for a very long time, I mean, it's been years that I've been doing it, but even in this message in the Gospel of Luke, one of the things I've been really encouraged by and reminded of is this idea that Jesus didn't come into the world just to give us a whole new set of rules that we need to make sure we focus on. But rather, Jesus wanted us to have certain attitudes. He wanted us to have a certain disposition and a certain spirit that we would embody. And so when we started into Luke chapter 6 and the Sermon on the Plain, that's really what we've been noticing. We've been noticing that his whole agenda is not simply, again, here's this laundry list of things, but rather he wants us to embody this message we learned about in chapter four, which is sheer grace, right? Like he's trying to get it in our heart and our mind that what will really change the world is not simply again, that we have the laundry list of things, but rather that we embody grace and we live this grace to the people that we are around. And so last week when we left off, we were looking at the scandalous command of Jesus, right? This one singular command that if we embody it, really changes the world, right? And so when he gave it, he says, I want you to love. But it wasn't simply, I want you to love God or love your neighbor, though that's true. But this is the scandalous command that he gave us. He says, if you're willing to listen, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who hurt you. I mean, this is radical stuff, right? He says, do unto others as you would like them to do to you. Be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. Now, I wanted to say for the record that when Jesus said that 2,000 years ago to that crowd, it, was, it would have laid them out flat, right? Like it would have been a hard command for them to embrace then. And before he showed up, nobody had ever said like, actually love your enemies. And not just like casually, he's like, do good, pray for, bless them, like do all this stuff. It's a crazy, crazy thing. But I look at those three verses right there and I go, man, imagine if we all embrace those three things. We just said, that's my ambition, right? To do those three things the world would be a very different place and we would be a very different people because we wouldn't simply love those who are bugged by us, but we would love those who bug us, right? And that's a different game. It's one thing to love those who are bugged by you. It's another thing to learn to love those who bug you. But that's exactly what Jesus is calling us to, right? To learn how to do that and learn how to do that well. And so he gave us the great command last week to love our enemies but in this, he wants us to have a certain attitude. And that is a scandalous attitude that we're looking at today, right? It's this attitude that he wants us to embody. Now, this starts in Luke chapter 6, verse 37. But I want to set the context again, right? What has he just told us? He said, I want you to do to others as you would like them to do to you. And then in that, I want you to be compassionate, just as God is compassionate with you, right? From this, he goes immediately into this next statement. He says, do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will come back against you. See, I want us to understand what Jesus is precisely getting at here. It's a very complicated idea. It's very deep. It's the first point in your notes. What he's saying is, don't be a jerk. Pretty simple. Don't be a jerk. Now, I'll, I'll tell you why this is really critical to me. Um, I think it's easy for us when we are bothered by somebody or somebody has hurt us in some way or frustrated us in some capacity. It's easy to be, to think, or to feel like a jerk, right? It is for me. I mean, I've had foes in my life. I've had critics that have been sort of ungracious with me. And my attitude is instantly kind of judgmental or condemning of them in some capacity. I don't want to be their friend. I don't want to think well of them. I, I kind of want to be a jerk in return. And so Jesus gives us this command. And it's like every morning we need to wake up, go in the mirror, put our hands on the counter, look ourselves right in the face. and be like, okay, today, here's my objective. Don't be a jerk to people especially the difficult people or the mean people or the unpleasant people in your life. Now, to try to understand this a little bit better, I want us to go back to verse 37 here for just a second so we can highlight a couple of things, right? Because I think it's important. This is one of those verses that everybody loves to quote, and oftentimes we stretch it beyond its boundaries. And so I want to kind of keep it in its proper perspective and pocket. 
Because here's the first thing we have to understand about what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that being judicious is wrong. He's not saying that having moral discernment is an improper thing. That's not his heart here at all, right? There is a time and a place to be judicious in life. And there's a time and a place to address concrete right and concrete wrong. So let's not start thinking that this is just absolute, just open field. Everything goes. There are no rules. That's not what he's saying, right? But what he's warning of is when we go beyond being judicious and we just become judgy, right? Where we're not just simply trying to make sure we have moral concern, but we move into this place of personal condemnation of other people, right? So it's not just about discerning a matter, but it's about actually condemning the person. Jesus is like, when you go to that place and that you think you're morally superior and they're morally inferior, and from that you're allowed to kind of cast blame and judgment and render condemnation, He says, that is when we are in dangerous space, right? In fact, it's interesting, this word uh, condemn here, literally it means hard-hearted. It's where we look at somebody we disagree with, and instead of our heart breaking for their circumstance, or even breaking for their poor decision-making, we instead just have this hardness of heart, and we're like, they're idiots, they're dumb, they're fools, they're stupid, you know, and, and we sort of just kind of render condemnation and judgment. Jesus says, that's not the stuff of my kingdom. That is not the stuff of sheer grace. That is not the stuff that will actually change and move lives. In fact, it's interesting to me, there is this um, section uh, that Paul writes in Romans, right? So the book of Romans is a letter that he writes to a bunch of new Christians that are right in the center of the empire, right? And he's wanting them to understand how they interact with their world and how they are to understand sheer grace and everything else. And in chapter one, he goes through this long list of sins, right? And some of them are really scandalous and some of them are maybe less scandalous, but it's this giant list. And it's one of those lists that it's really easy for those of us in religious settings or church settings to look at the list and go like, oh, Those are the bad people in that list. Those are the ones you want to watch out for. Those are the ones you're allowed to judge. And Paul knows that the original audience, just as much as us, would have a temptation to read Romans 1 and then want to wag our fingers, right? And start to go, oh, they're bad, and they're bad, and they're bad, and they're bad. And uh, it's our job to go on social media and point out they're bad. And like all those kinds of things. Like he knows that's the temptation. So then he moves into chapter two and he gives us a warning if we want to kind of stand in judgment based on chapter one and the people of chapter one, this is what he says going into chapter two. He says, you may think you can condemn such people, the people from the previous chapter, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse when you say that they are wicked and they should be punished. You are condemning yourself for you who judge others. You do the very same things. And says, we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? See, now I know he's really kind of stern there, but I think the point he's getting at is really clear, right? He's saying we really don't have the room or the bandwidth to stand in judgment because quite frankly, we're all broken people. We're all incomplete in some capacity. And even though we might look at the list in chapter one and go, but those are the scandalous things. What Paul would say is, yeah, they may be scandalous, but, but you have different things and you have different challenges and you have different temptations. In fact, if we took chapter one and we kind of categorized it, we see there's like family sins and there's social sins and then there's moral sins. And the reality is, again, we're all going to fall victim to something at some point. And so he's saying, we can't stand in the place of God. Only God's allowed to judge. We have to have a different disposition. But then Paul adds something to this. After warning us, like, man, you don't want to go down the road. You don't want to start rendering all of this justice out when you're not even qualified to do that. He says something that is designed to encourage us about God, as well as give us direction on how we can be like God when we're dealing with people who have issues in their life. He says, don't you see In verse four, how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you. Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sins? I want you to look at those words. Notice how God is kind and 
tolerant and patient, right? These are critical because what Paul is saying is, you know what? This is how God wins us over from our own problems, right? He wins us over in his kindness toward us. And so in the same way that God is kind toward us in our incompleteness, he's saying, hey, just pay that forward, right? You do unto others as God does unto you, right? That's the spirit of this whole concept here. That's the essence that we are to embody. And so Jesus is being really clear. He said in Luke 6, be compassionate. And by compassionate, he means don't be judgy, don't condemn, right? And I think it's important because you know what? Here's what I found in my own life because I've done some of this stuff before. I'm really good at being judgy sometimes. And here's what I've learned. Every time I'm judgy or I condemn somebody for some activity or action or position or belief or whatever it is, I find that it divides more than it unifies. It oftentimes just wounds a person far more than it's ever going to woo a person to my position. In the process of it, I find that not only does it not help them, but it sort of poisons my attitude regarding them, right? Now, I see them even worse than before because I've now rendered a judgment that sours me to them, and therefore, I'm starting to get hard-hearted toward them, which is the very essence of condemnation. But then I think there's another reason that Jesus points out here for why we don't want to engage in this kind of thing. Notice what he says again in verse 37. Don't judge others. And you won't be judged. So he's trying to incentivize this, right? He's trying to say like, man, this is exactly why you don't want to do it. And then he says, you don't want to condemn others or it's going to come back against you. Now, I want you to notice that. That's really interesting to me. Um, When I was a kid, uh, I was not a reader, uh, but there was one set of books that I'd read and they were called Choose Your Own Adventures, right? So I don't remember if you remember these books. It was a whole set of books, right? Choose Your Own Adventure. And it was really cool, right? Like the 80s gave us cool stuff like big hair and metal bands and power ballads and like, you know, just these books. Like everything was cool in the 80s, right? And these particular books were real simple. You would read the story up to a point and then you get to a juncture where you'd say, um, okay, so you can either go to page 46 for this or page 52 for that. And you would choose your own adventure. And what we see from Jesus here is that he's saying it's kind of like that. In other words, he's saying to the degree and standard that you hold others, God will hold you. And so in the negative here, if we are critical and fault-finding and short and condescending, what in essence he's saying is, okay, um, if you think that is something that is okay to hold others to, God will just take that standard, that yardstick that we use and say, great, if it's good for them, it's good for you. It's like we're creating our own final exam in the end. It's very customized, right? And so I look at that and I go, man, that's a really compelling reason for me to not be a jerk to people, right? Because if that's going to be the standard, what I think others should be, God's going to use that for me. And he sees me much more clearly than even I see others or myself. I go, man, I don't want to be a jerk. Instead, if there's anything, I want to be number two in your notes. I want to be a prodigal. I want to be a prodigal. Now, right now you're like, okay, now what's he talking about? Because aren't prodigals bad? Well, there's two different definitions for prodigal. The first is that one we think of with the prodigal son, right? Where it's just flippant and it's reckless spending and reckless living and it's just over the top kind of ridiculousness. That's one definition. But the other definition is a positive one where we are lavish and giving, we're generous and bountiful. And it's that second definition that I believe we as followers of Jesus are to embrace, right? Where we're more known for our love than our disapproval We're more known for acceptance over rejection, and we're more known for understanding over criticism. In other words, my encouragement for all of us is to live like the prodigal father as he interacted with the prodigal son, right? You think about that story, like here is this prodigal parent that lavishly loves their child who is reckless and doing foolish things, right? Like over the top, like when the, the son comes to the dad and is like, give me all of my inheritance. The dad's not like, shame on you, man. And doesn't like kind of kick him to the side and move on. No, he actually kind of says, okay, you're going to go be reckless, but here you go. And when the son comes back, the father lavishes love and he hugs and has this big party for the son. And so it reminds me that we are to be prodigal-like parents to the prodigal-like people in our lives, right? Because that's the essence of compassion. It's not judging. It's not condemning. Rather, it's going the extra mile to do the opposite thing, which is why then Jesus says, first off, forgive others and you will be forgiven. 
See, this is a great word, forgive here. Because literally what it means is to set a person free. To set them free, all right? So here, here's what that means. I, I was thinking about my own life because there have been people, like I said, who have wounded me or hurt me. And, and I find that if I don't forgive them, I'm actually imprisoning them and I'm imprisoning myself. I stay in prison in my own hurt, my own bitterness, my own frustration. I stay guarded, all those kinds of things. But if I forgive, it's like I'm saying, I'm gonna set you free from my standards I'm going to set you free from my hurts. I'm going to set you free from all the ways that I want to characterize you and say you're not what I want you to be and you need to be something else. It's like, no, man, when I forgive, it's like I'm free and they're free and that's a healthy thing. I think that is really the essence of sheer grace because that's what God does through the good news of Jesus, right? He's saying, I'm setting you free. I'm not holding your garbage against you anymore. And we still have junk and do dumb things, but He sets us free, right? So in the same way that God sets us free, we want to set other people free by forgiving others. And therefore, we experience forgiveness. Now with that, he says, since you've already forgiven, drop the four and give, right? And that's his next thing. He says, give and you will receive. So again, generosity, abundance, right? He says, your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, making room for more, running over and poured into your lap. He says, the amount that you give will determine the amount you get back. So again, here's another choose your own adventure idea, right? So it's like, hey, to the degree you lean into this, you believe this, and you live this out is to the degree that God is going to give it back to you. And so when we think about giving, it could be in all sorts of capacity. It might be your time, or it might be your talents. It might be your treasures. It might be giving kindness or compassion or forgiveness, right? It might be giving help or six feet of distance or toilet paper. You're like, I don't know what all you might feel led to give or called to give or you're able to give, but he really kind of makes the point of we're built to be generous and give away. In fact, we're even talking this week, it's our fifth Sunday, and we typically have a benevolent Sunday at church where as you're walking out the door, there's people holding uh, like boxes and you can give to the benevolence fund. And we're like, we can't really create that electronically at this point. But even as you're giving and you think about maybe that particular need, we know that right now in our community, there's going to be increasing needs for people. And as a church, we want to be available to those things too. And so it's just another place that we can think about how to be generous, right? Because that's the kingdom. The kingdom is being a prodigal parent, a prodigal person, lavish, giving, caring, investing, right? Going all in because God says he wants to give back to us, right? And that's the other part that Jesus has there, right? And notice the ratio is not one to one. It's not like you give time and he gives the same amount of time or you give a buck and he gives a buck. No, there's this picture of like a bowl getting stuff poured into it, crushed down, overflowing. In fact, it reminds me of when I go to like a Mongolian grill, right? You know, it's like they give you the bowl and you go through the whole little line of food. And I'm that guy that's like putting stuff in, crushing it down, putting more stuff in, crushing, 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 a pack in that bowl full. I'm coming to the end. I'm still putting stuff on. It's falling out. I'm trying to get it back up on top and give it to the guy before everything falls out of the bowl. And it's like, that's what God wants to do when it comes to generosity toward us, right? He wants us to be generous so we can experience his generosity in turn. And so he says, give generously, forgive fully, because that is how we really signal that our attitude is what uh, really God wants us to have as an attitude. Now, from that, he reminds us again of the negative. So Jesus keeps flip-flopping back and forth between um, love your enemies, have compassion, um, do these right things. And then he goes into, therefore, don't do the wrong things. And then he goes back to, so do the right things. And now he reminds us again, well, you don't want to do the wrong things because you're setting your own bar. And so he goes right back into the warnings of why you don't want to judge and why you don't want to condemn and rather you want to be compassionate. And he gives three illustrations to really kind of drive this home. And so if you're taking notes, it's the third thing in your notes. He's basically going to tell us to look up and look in. And what I mean by that is look up to God and look in at your own life before you look out at others and down on them, right? That's what he's going to drive home. So three illustrations. The first one, he says, listen, why do you think you can judge and condemn? He says, can any one blind person lead another blind person? He says, won't they both fall into a ditch if you do that? You're like, yeah, no doubt, right? Like none of us are going to get in our car 
blindfold ourselves so we can drive and then put a passenger in there who is also blindfolded and gives us the directions, right? We're like, that's a, that's a rotten idea, right? We don't play baseball in pitch black because we know that's a bad idea, right? And so in the same way, what Jesus is really getting at here is he says, listen, um, you and I, we do not have the full working knowledge in the life of a person to know everything that's going on, the motives that have driven them, the circumstances that they faced. We don't have all that knowledge to be able to roll in and then in a moment decide we can judge them or condemn them for something because, again, we just don't know their story. I had a friend of mine that once said, we know less than half of everything. And my wife loves to say, until we've walked a mile in somebody else's shoes, we don't understand all the, the context and all the problems. And there have been people in my life that I know, I have been very like judgmental of a decision they make or an action they undertake. And then I come into more knowledge. And even though it's not trying to condone the action, I realize, wow, that's what they're coming out of. What a giant challenge. And it makes my heart break for them more than I'm in this space to, to judge them, right? And so Jesus says, man, you don't want to do that. You know less than half of everything. So don't stand in judgment when it's oftentimes flowing from a level of ignorance in our lives. The next illustration he uses, he says, students, they're not greater than their teacher. But the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. See, this is pretty simple. It's just saying, you know what? Uh, if you're a newly hired intern, uh, you probably shouldn't roll into the CEO's office and say, hey, bro, I know how we should run this company now, right? It's because you're the newbie. You're the learner. They're the teacher. And so in the same way, Jesus is saying, you know what? He's the only teacher, right? We don't get to play that role. We're students, and we're all fellow students together. So as soon as I'm judging a fellow student, it's sort of silly. And in fact, here's a way I could put it, right? It'd be like we're all in class as students. Jesus has his desk up at the front. He's the teacher. But I decide to get up, walk to the front of the class, sit down at his desk, grab the grade book, and I start passing out grades for everybody, right? So I decide, you know what? That person gets a D, that person gets an F, but that person gets an A because I like that person. And it would be ridiculous, cute and ridiculous, right? Because I'm not equipped to pass out the grades. I'm just a fellow student. I'm not the teacher. And so this is Jesus's point, right? He's the teacher, we're the student. But then he says something positive here that I think we can take to heart. He says, if we actually stop trying to be the teacher and we just function as the student, we will learn to be like the teacher. It doesn't say we become the teacher. We learn to become like the teacher. And what I love about this is paradoxically, the more we do that and we watch Jesus and we learn from Jesus, strangely, we lose the judgy spirit and we embrace a merciful spirit. Because here's what we learn from the teacher. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden that I give you is light. See, when we try to not be the teacher and we just simply learn from the teacher, we end up having the disposition of the teacher, which is mercy and kindness and compassion and grace and tolerance for people in their broken space. And then Jesus gives a third illustration just to nail this one down. He says, why do you worry about the speck that is in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log that is in your own eye? He says, that's hypocritical. That's playing the part of an actor. That's putting on a mask. That's being phony. We should all acknowledge our weaknesses. He says, first, get rid of the log that is in your own eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck that is in your friend's eye. Now, if I really simplified this and said, all right, what's Jesus really trying to tell all of us? What he's frankly saying is all of our poo stinks, all right? He's saying none of us are so perfected, so awesome, so perfect that we don't somehow have something sticking out of our face, right? And then he uses a strong hyperbole here, right? Where he's like, your friend, even if their thing is really, really scandalous, if you're the judgmental one, your issue is the bigger thing. And he doesn't simply say plank. He literally is talking about like a giant log. He's talking about like a load-bearing beam for a ceiling or to hold up an entire roof system. I mean, it's a really big thing. He's saying, that's going to be the problem. You may think your stuff is small in comparison to somebody else's big thing, but if we are harsh and uncaring and judgmental, our thing becomes the bigger thing. And so he says, what's critical is that we deal with our own poor attitude first right? Our own harsh or critical spirit. 
Because when we do that, then we can see well enough to help another person. So it, it's not to say that we, we never step in and we don't come alongside. No, we, we really should, but we have to make sure that our heart and our tone is not to be right, to not simply condemn or you know, to be somehow harsh with people, but, but rather we need to come in just like if somebody had a speck caught in their eye and we want to be gentle and caring and very slow and we want to ease into that so we could genuinely serve them in some capacity as opposed to simply kind of stand over the top and be like, yep, you got it wrong. I got it right. That's all that matters. Like that is the unhealthy thing that he does not want us to do. He wants us to really be humble, kind of be self-reflective. And then from that, we're going to be in a healthy space to come along somebody, alongside somebody else and help them out as well. And so Jesus just keeps driving this home, the attitude that we are to have, right? And I'll tell you right now, this is just personally me. Uh, this is a good reminder. I, I kept laughing at myself all week long uh, when I would be on social media and, and then I would see people post things that just bugged me, right? It's not my opinion or my perspective. And instead of kind of feeling broken or bad for them, I was just like, man, like, what do I do with these crazy nut jobs? You know, that's kind of my attitude, right? Or uh, even last weekend, I was driving home after church and there was like 9,000 cars that seemed like at Cherry Valley Falls wanted to go hiking. And I was judging all these packs of people, right? Not kind of like going, man, somebody's got to educate them. I'm like, no, somebody's got to hit them. You know what I mean? Like that was my rotten attitude. And it just reminds me, man, judgment is so easy to come by. And yet I have never welcomed the opinions of people that I felt judged by but I've often received opinions from people who I knew really cared. And I think that's the attitude Jesus is getting at, that we really care as opposed to we simply judge, right? So with that, where does Jesus meet real life in all of this, right? What are the diagnostics that we want to ask ourselves when we think about this passage that frankly, all of us, all of us are really good at judgment and condemnation. So what do we want to remember from this? Well, first of all, the first question is who or what do I tend to judge more than be generous toward, and how can I change that, right? Who or what do I tend to not be generous toward, and how can I change that, right? It may be political opinions you see uh, on social media. It may be just world opinions or different ideas or people that have a different life and lifestyle than you, and more than breaking for them, you're just sort of angry at them or put off by them or just don't care for them or don't like them. And Jesus is like, great, then how do you love them in their space, right? That's the first question. The second question, who have I wronged and they need to make it right? Or as Jesus would say, who do you need to free, right? And part of that, when you do that, you free yourself as well as freeing the person that you forgive. And then third, who do I need to come alongside and help them back to health and wholeness? Because you know what? We all have people in our lives that part of this frustration we feel is they make decisions that really do puncture us, right? They, they either directly wound us or they, they somehow just break our hearts. And sometimes in our self-protection, um, we, we kind of take this position of judgment or harshness or sternness. And yet Jesus calls us to come alongside and help. He says that in Galatians 6. Paul writes about that. And he's like, hey, you who are spiritual, come alongside those who are weak and struggling. And I believe that Paul says that because he knows that's the spirit of Jesus and how we can really love the people around us. And so we want to be that. We want to do that. We want to have that attitude to follow his command to love God, neighbor, and even those who frustrate us. So let's go ahead and pray together right now. Jesus, I thank you for the reminder to not judge. I thank you for the reminder to not condemn because you know what? That's outside of our pay grade. Like we just don't, we don't get to do that and get away with it. Rather, we're just simply uh, creating the the, the, the measuring stick that will be applied to our own lives, right? You're like, I'll customize to whatever standard you want. And so I pray that we will remember to be gracious and thoughtful, kind and compassionate, even when we have to make moral judgments that we don't come across as, again, a morally superior, but rather we would be messengers and ambassadors of hope and health and healing even in those times. So help us to embody your disposition and your spirit that you have for us. We ask this in your good and kind name. Amen.